Welcome to MUFON Canada's UFO Primer. I'm Dave Palachuk, National Director of MUFON Canada and Executive Producer of MUFON Canada's podcast. MUFON is the world's largest and oldest civilian UFO investigative and research organization with members in many countries around the world. Our number one goal is to be the inquisitive mind's refuge seeking answers to the most ancient question, are we alone in the universe? Simple answer is no. Do you have UFO reports to share, armchair UFO investigator aspirations, or want to train and join our investigative team, MUFON is here for you. Will you please join us in our quest to discover the truth? What do we know after 50 years of MUFON? One, UFOs are real. UFOs represent advanced technology not from any country on planet Earth. Two, we are not alone in the universe. We never have been. Three, according to the data we collect, our universe is teeming with life. And four, the UFO phenomenon is worthy of scientific study because tremendous breakthroughs will result if we allow our scientists and engineers to do so without fear of ridicule. Each episode will feature a guest host along with our very special guests who are willing to disclose their knowledge on ufology. I hope you enjoy the information you hear in this podcast and use it to help decide if you believe. Embrace the future with Move On Canada. Welcome to Move On Canada. I'm Dave Palachuk, the National Director of MUFON Canada, and for this episode, the host of the show. In this episode, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a friend, a fellow ufologist, and our Master of Ceremonies at MUFON Canada's annual Alien Cosmic Expo. Welcome, Victor Vigiani. Great to be with you, David. It's uh, I just sort of wondering who you were talking about during that, uh, that, that, that file, but I recognize my name and my group with it. Great to be with you, David. Great to be with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Victor, because we are going to discuss something very important tonight, and that's basically the New York Times. You know, I, I, I said I'm honoring that article because it's about time, and you and I are going to have a little discussion about, is it really disclosure? And I know you want to talk about the implications of this. Um, well, I've done two podcasts already today, so I'm kind of running out of breath. It's been a very busy day for MUFON Canada, and we're getting more and more requests for information. So hopefully the uh, listeners, the viewers, our followers will get a lot of information out of this from you and give them some food for thought. So let's start off with what happened about two weeks ago with the New York Times and their latest uh, newspaper article and how that relates to what's been going on with the New York Times. Well, essentially, uh, you you have to go back to uh, December uh, 17th, 2017. That's when this all kind of started. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times uh, uh, released just a blockbuster uh, article written by Helen Cooper, Ralph Blumenthal, and uh, and Leslie Kane. And at that particular point in time, they made public some fascinating information about the now famous or infamous Tic Tac video and the disclosure, uh, I use that word a small d, with the revelation probably a better word by the U.S. Navy that they had captured some pretty significant video of uh, several kinds of craft and I think there were three, uh, there were three objects uh, kind of captured, one in the air, two in the air and one kind of over the surface of the water. And the, the key point with that, that whole article, it was the, um, I guess, you know, you take your finger out of the dam and that sort of uh, opened up the whole area uh, to the flood of water uh, that, that we're seeing right now. It's like almost waves lapping at the shore. And the New York Times is responsible for these waves. Uh, they are primarily the ones who've uh, taken up the gauntlet and said that, this is a serious matter. And when I say the, uh, the New York Times, I'm talking about the media in general. And we're grateful to the New York Times for doing this. It's a lot like the Pentagon Papers. Uh, back in, in, the, uh, in the time, in, in the 80s, when the Pentagon Papers came out, it was quite clear that the establishment news media, the New York Times at the time, took the, the risk, the gamble, uh, that they rolled the dice, and the ownership of the New York Times, the publishers of the New York Times, and the major editors for the New York Times said, let's go for this. 
And as a result, they published the Pentagon Papers and everyone knows exactly what happened as a result of that. And that was big news, just as was uh, Watergate. This is a very, very similar situation. This is the beginning of a breakwater benchmark uh, situation where the U.S. Navy has implicitly and explicitly admitted that UFOs or the UFOs that they saw and they captured, that their pilots captured on video, were real. They were truly anomalous. And one of the pilots, uh, David Fraver, has gone so far as to say, as far as he's concerned, as a pilot, and he's been given permission to do this. They, they can say anything they want right now, which is a big move forward, that these things that he saw, in his opinion, were not of this earth. Right. So after all of that was released, uh, it was sort of like a head whip for just about everybody in the media, and they began to cover it. And since then, over the last three years, these things have been coming out. The New York Times, uh, through, um, you know, I guess, interviews with Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal and other articles, they've, they've really kind of uh, uh, began to open up the understanding of what the government knows uh, with the HEP program uh, that everyone knows about and also the, the kind of revelations that the Pentagon made to say that they actually verified that these videos were real. Now yeah. I've heard some discussion in some in some <laughs> in some quarters that these things weren't supposed to come out. You know, everybody mm. said, "My goodness, why did this happen?" Uh, but you can bet your bottom dollar that somebody in the Pentagon and the U.S. Navy made a conscious decision to say uh, this stuff is going to go out. The public needs to know about it. The only problem that I have is the way it's coming out, which is not a problem. It's just it's almost like a, a slow drip kind of disclosure, uh, which you, I guess when you think, when you you call, think about it, that's yeah. how it should happen. When you call disclosure with a mini D, uh, with the little D, I call it mini disclosure. So they're mm -hmm. not trying to scare the masses like they all thought mm -hmm. would happen in the 50s. Right. And of course, so the, the newspaper article you're talking about that happened in uh, 2017 is right. referring to the U.S. Nimitz, USS Nimitz incident of 2014. So mm -hmm. it was still held for at least three years. And is it really true, and I need your opinion, that Tom DeLonge and his group of To The Stars Academy encouraged the New York Times to release this? I, I don't know about that one, Dave. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, uh, that uh, To The Stars Academy was singularly responsible for encouraging mm -hmm. the New York Times to do what they did. I think you have to look at what the Two Stars Academy really is, in, in my from my perspective. The Pentagon needed, and so did the U.S. Navy, they needed some sort of, of conduit through which uh, to release this stuff. Now, they did it on their own, but they needed a group uh, to interpret this information, to give it a, a, public, a public face, other than a military perspective. Right, they're all ex-military people, but they That's are right. in the public now. That's right. Right. So what you get is someone like, uh, you know, former deputy, uh, assistant deputy of uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Chris Mellon. You've got a guy like Hal Putoff and, and uh, you know, to a certain degree, Tom DeLonge, who has no military or, or political background. But you get people like Putoff and, and Mellon who are high flyers uh, within the, the political realm and within the realm of science. You get these people coming out and saying that what the Navy put out was worth investigating. And then they went a bit further. Chris Mellon is on the public record as saying that these things that they saw, that the U.S. Navy pilots saw, were in fact real. And they displayed technology that, that we were just not capable of, of doing, of, of, uh, right. of implementing. So, so, so they, clear. they first admitted that they were their videos, and then they came mm -hmm. back later and said, yes, they are uh, authenticated. And then he came right. back a third time and said, yes, they are UFOs. Otherwise, we yeah. don't know what they are. So they're, and of course, it's UAP now, un yeah. Unidentified yeah. Aerial Phenomenon. So, so that's three times that they actually announced that it's all real. And that's in 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to jump forward to 2020. And it's almost mm -hmm. like, let's do it in COVID. Everybody's paying attention to other <laughs> things. And we can sneak right. it in under the radi uh, radar. But... I still think it's more than a little mini disclosure. So let's carry on with the with what's going on to get to two weeks ago Monday, approximately, with the latest thing and how it affects everything. So, um, you do uh, you you I think you were the one who told me or somebody else. But after the Nimitz incident, the Tic Tac Go Fast and, and Gimbal videos, they released nine more. 
they let them out and made them public of nine more videos, but they almost saw no publicity. So what happened? Did mainstream media say, well, they made the disclosure, we're not going to talk, talk about it anymore? Well, I think it's a matter uh, of almost a bit of an overload in, in, in a way. It, it's very difficult to release um, credible looking things that the general public, I'm not talking about people like you and I who are within this sort of UFO uh, bubble of information. We, that we, you know, you and I live and breathe this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're not the only ones. Like, there's that whole UFO, UAP research community out there. There's thousands of people that do this every single day. And they are well versed not only in the UFO phenomenon or UAP phenomenon, but they're also well versed in how this stuff has been repressed and kept down and you know thrown behind a, a wall of secrecy. So they're all familiar with that. And as a result of that, uh, this kind of revelation is almost for them a bit of a ho hum. How many times can you really show you know a little blip of light or a little new video and uh, Im impress the, the UFO community? Uh, they, they really not they're not impressed by that they're more impressed by the process as to why the pentagon or the u.s military the u.s navy whoever's responsible why they're doing it it's not the what of what's going on here it's the why it's why the is this stuff being released in the way that it is and that's the key point that everybody outside of the sort of uap research community bubble that's what they need to understand. That's, and it's a good thing that you're doing, the kind of things you're doing on uh, on this kind of podcast is to allow the general public to see a little bit of the what. And that's important. They need to see what's going on uh, in terms of lights in the sky. But the story behind it and the why is much, much more devastatingly interesting uh, to, to uh, the people, to the general public, and to the human family, to the global human family. And the only process is going to get the, the human family globally to understand it is the mainstream media. Uh, you can put it on the internet, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I firmly believe that the internet is a, a great way to get information out there. But the degree of believability, the degree of confidence that the general public has in the internet about a lot of stuff is very dismissive. So uh, I, I think it's, it's really contingent uh, upon us that to to get this stuff out into the mainstream media, and the mainstream media is picking it up slowly. Mm -hmm, very slow. That's okay. Yeah. So you get, you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, and some of the other, uh, you know, more reputable newspapers and media outlets taking this much more seriously. And we need to get our people on the television with their face there and, you know, 14 million people watching it over a week span and understanding, oh my goodness, how long has this been going on? Right. And why don't I know about it? And why is the government, or hasn't the government told me about this? Why now? Those are all good why questions. And how are we going to move forward with educating? As you said earlier during our, our post interview, uh, or pre interview discussion, we have to educate people about the process as to what's happening and why it's happening. And we can go into that uh, in many different ways. The, the biggest thing that's happened as, the, as a result of the why is what uh, the Senate has done, the Senate Committee on Intelligence, the Select Committee on Intelligence, Marco Rubio and, and, uh, and Senator Warner have taken a huge step forward in, in, their, in their release of, the, um, of a very important document that the Senate will be passing. And in that document, it's sort of like the 2,000 or 20,000 a 21 uh, financial statement about what the uh, what the intelligence community is going to have to do with the funds that the Senate's going to give them. Right. And this act, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in the act itself, it talks about advanced aerial threats. And there's seven or eight paragraphs in this whole information telling the intelligence community that they must gather information on the UAP phenomenon and report, once this legislation is passed, and report to the Senate about their findings of all the gathering of their information on the UAP. They actually use the, the term UAP, uh, unidentified objects, uh, they, they, they go through the whole thing. Right. So that Navy Intelligence is now uh, on, on the hook of being responsible for gathering information, and this has never happened before. No, and we've been pushing that for years. But I understand they're also not just going to be getting the information from the intelligence 
agency, but they're going to get the opinions. Uh, is this a threat or not? Well, so that's that the other part of this problem, yeah. Right, yeah. and because we don't want to be, um, you know, victims of, of false flags and, and false wars and false threats mm -hmm. from government. So, and I mm -hmm. think the senator in the Senate that demanded this and wrote this paper don't want to fall into that also. So, yes, you can tell us what you're doing, you can report and everything, but you have to give us the truth, the evaluation. Is this a national threat? That's right. Well, what I, what I think is going to happen is that once they, uh, when I say the Senate Intelligence Committee reviews whatever the, uh, the, the Navy and the Pentagon and the intelligence community gives them, once they review all the information, um, the way I heard Rubio discuss this, uh, in a way, he was interviewed uh, by CBS in Miami. I'm not sure if you've seen that interview before. But he was very clear in what he said. He said, look, folks, there's things flying over our military bases, and we don't know what they are. We have no control. That means that the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Pentagon military installations all over the United States of America, they have just all but admitted that they have no control over their own airspace. Right. Now, you try telling that to the general public. <laughs> now, separate that, though. We've got to be careful here separate that from a threat the fact is that these things come and go with impunity we all know that they've been doing it for years you've witnessed it i've witnessed it oh yes uh, it's, it's been going on uh and if if we don't have if they don't have control over their own airspace if the united states doesn't that's a very meaningful situation that could be interpreted as a threat and the united states government will be the first one to jump on the threat bandwagon. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I'm afraid of too. So, yes, but let's put it. Me too, and that's let, exactly how I feel about yeah, it. Yeah, but let's put that into retros retrospect of the Chilean government. Their military investigate UFOs or UAPs, and everything is public, and everything is disclosed to the public, including some of the mm -hmm. greatest videos that I've ever seen. And they openly, the general that's in charge of this entire program, openly says. We don't know who they are, what they are, where they come from, what they're here for, but they're no threat because they haven't done anything except mm -hmm. observe, to yeah. our knowledge. Maybe they're taking yeah. resources and we don't know it. But they're not, you know, with the flag, they're not up there waving that, that national threat flag. Mm -hmm. They're just saying it's real, and they've been saying it for a number of years, so... Why is it the U.S. has to wave the national threat flag? And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a good point that you raised. I think if you look at the, the, foreign, the foreign policy uh, situation and the domestic uh, military situation in the United States, right now, and even the political situation, even if you go back years, uh, you, you have a situation in the United States uh, that they, I don't know if you're familiar with the document, the... Uh, it's a statement by Paul Wolfowitz. It's the, it's the uh, statement or principle of the new American century. And in that, in that statement, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, and along with some other uh, writers, enlisted the term, brought about the term of full spectrum dominance. And that was okay. the role of the United States. That happened just after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. This document came out in the uh, early part of the 90s. And it, uh, the United States took on the responsibility on their own, which they're really, really good at, of saying that we will be the policemen of the globe. We will be the ones that will protect everyone. And where democracy is failing, we will step in and make sure that things are going right. That whole idea of full spectrum dominance comes into play with this too. It, right. it appears that uh, if the media gets caught up in the whole idea, well, this is a United States issue. It isn't really. It's not. It's a global issue. It's very global. And that's what the Chilean government, the Chilean government, um, France, Colombia too, Colombia, all, France, all, all of this. Yeah, all, right. it's, it's all over the globe. Yes, that's right. So that's what we have to keep in, in perspective. And I think if we, if the the whole idea of a, the threat scenario keeps on, be, the, the the drumbeat of the th of the threat scenario keeps on banging away, a lot of the public are going to be uh, misled by the fact that this is a global issue. And, uh, you know, it could happen. Well, my goodness, if the United States thinks it's a threat, then get those bombers up in the air and make sure that we don't <laughs> see these things. And, and meanwhile, they don't have any idea that these things have been hovering over nuclear installations and shutting their nuclear missiles down by the dozens. 
since 1965. Oh, he, yeah. He doesn't know that either. No. Uh, we all suspect they have. You and I have believed that for years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's happened in other countries. Uh, it's happened at U.S. military bases in other mm -hmm. countries. Look at Rendlesham Forest. I mean, in the U.K., a U.S. military site in the U.K. that nobody really knew about, and they got the visit. Sure. Um, and, and, and now I'm saying that, you know, like, stop thinking this is not for real because this is as, as real, and I'm going to quote Paul Hellyer, bless his heart, when he said UFOs are as real <laughs> as the airplanes over your head. That's right. And he yeah. said that back in the, in oh, when was the National Congress? Um, yeah. 2005. 2005. And yeah. Amazing. And, uh, and yeah, you know what, Paul? You were right. And we've all been right. We've known it, but we just couldn't prove it. So, again, we are into the, is it full disclosure yet? So let's jump forward to the newspaper article a couple weeks ago when they, again, the New York Times published an article and verbatim quoted, we have a vehicle not from this earth. Mm -hmm. Basically, the U.S. just announced that, yes, they have UFOs, which a sidebar is it kind of proves Bob Lazar's Right, you know, Bob, mm -hmm. with his, I worked at Area 51 and nobody would believe him, but everything's been coming true, what he said uh, over the years, and it kind of indicates all this, like, yeah, the U.S. says they have UFOs. So, um, a little bit of further about that is, I've always believed that our technology's been leaped by being helped. Maybe we back-engineered things, so how long have they had these UFOs? Fiber optics. I did my thesis on fiber optics in, in college mm -hmm. and university. We were 100 years ahead of that, of, of what we should have been doing at the time. So where did we get that from? From the UFOs? Laser and fiber optics? I don't think we would have had it even today if we didn't That's have help. Yeah. So, again, the thing is, the New York Times said that the U.S. military has a UFO. They didn't say how many. They didn't say where. Mm -hmm. They didn't say what type. But they actually admitted they have one. To me, that is almost disclosure with a big capital D. Well, I think it, you're, you're exactly right. They, they, have, they have sort of an inside track on the technology. And the, whatever the technology is, and I think we kind of all know that it has something to do with um, anti-gravitic technology of some kind. So that these craft, wherever they're from, uh, have some sort of capacity to move at or beyond light speed mm -hmm. in an anti-gravitic way and that technology I think I know uh, is in the possession or at least the understanding of physicists within the United States and, po and possibly in, in other countries too but which I think is... the idea of anti-gravitics is definitely there and I think the materials with which these craft are made uh, these exotic uh, metals that are that, that are that are being used are part of that whole scenario. And that's right. why I've, I've been on top of this for many, many years. And once I saw that, you know, following UFO sightings, following the, poli the, po uh, the political ideas and that they're you know, engulfing that whole thing, this is all going to come down, Dave, to technology. Yes. And how we can show, how I think people like you and I, and people that are bringing this information forward, saying, listen, Without weaponizing it, that's another story. That goes yeah. back to the threat scenario. But that's another, that's that. another that's podcast. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but the idea behind um, the elimination of the fossil fuel uh, concept of, of energy, eliminating that is going to be a quantum leap in our intellectual uh, evolution. Okay, And once we decide to uh, examine, just not just the UAP issue, but examine the way this technology can improve the fate of the planet, uh, with respect to f whether it be free energy or zero point, whatever that stuff is, whatever it is, that will eliminate fossil fuels, that will be a huge pill for the human family to swallow. For the human and family, it'll it, kill big business that are petroleum based, you know, like well, make all their that's trillions. A that's a big yeah. problem. You're right. We're going to have to face this thing in, in a very wise, mm -hmm. incredible way. We're going to have to convince a lot of people that the fossil fuel industry has had its day. It's, it's over. It's, right. it's not only over because it's there's new technology coming in uh, that, that, that will be you know non-deleterious to the planet, but what we've been doing uh, since the Industrial Revolution is poisoning our planet, and we see that every single day. And that's another hill that, uh, and aside from the threat scenario, 
the, the whole fossil fuel industry is going to have to be re-engineered, retooled to pick up on and begin understanding that this new form of energy will transfer uh, billions and billions of dollars into industry. They don't know that yet. No. But once that concept comes up, people are going to wake up and say, my goodness, let's just put that behind us and move forward with this new kind of energy. And what can we do to, to make it happen more, more, more quickly? And I don't think, if let's say we have zero point energy and uh, anti gravitic engines like Bob Lazar said he worked on, mm -hmm. they've never disclosed that and it still might not be for many, many years. Yes, UFOs are real. Yes, we're being, uh, we're being visited. No, there's no threat. They're here to help. They don't know how to transition away from fossil fuels. Yeah. And there's corporations, no yeah. yeah, there's no plan. They, they've been thinking about it for years, I'm pretty sure, because... I'm pretty sure big business know what the U.S. government has. And uh, and other, let's just not blame the U.S. I think there might be other captive material uh, and or machines, you know, UFOs around the world. Mm -hmm. we, let's just not blame the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just the energy or the, the propulsion. I mean, even Linda Moulton Howe had a little piece that she was given a material that he, she had analyzed by three or four different universities and not all in the US who kept saying this cannot be made in this earth. So we know there's other things available too and I can't imagine this earth where every country and every person has abilities or available energy to improve their life. That is mm -hmm. a giant leap. That to me is a thousand years from now but kind of hoping in in a hundred or less. <laughs> well, now that we're getting disclosure, and I think they need to, to work on that. So why is it the general public is, one, afraid of this, two, don't even give a damn about it? Like mm -hmm. like I said to you earlier, mm -hmm. I've talked to people, so what about the New York Times saying they have a UFO? What do you think about that? And the, the, the general consensus I had was, that's nice. It's like, yeah. <laughs> don't don't upset my little world. I don't mm -hmm. care about this stuff. It does not affect me. Well, you know, one day it might. And I'm not saying it in a bad way, mm -hmm. but no, the general anyways, public. Yeah. You said there's mm -hmm. only a, th this group of us who are into the, into the knowledge and doing the research and doing what we do, especially MUFON Canada, we are growing a huge database, which has helped people like yourself and everybody else who pulls mm -hmm. from that database. You know, that percentage is probably less than one percent of the entire population of the world. Of course, yeah. But why the rest of the world not jumping up and down and saying and demanding more? <laughs> well, I think it's 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 a lot like um, uh, how can I put it? It's it, knowing something, you know, intellectually knowing something. You know, you can you can grapple with uh, the, the knowing, but you you. Okay, I know that UFOs exist. I'm, you know, John Q. Public. I know they exist, or I know, I know about UFOs. But then taking the next step, the next intellectual leap that you have to take in order to understand any big, huge change um, in, in society, in, 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 in the cultural mores of your day, the next step in, um, in in understanding that is realizing that it, in fact, will change your life. And in a way, and I don't want to bring up the subject to discuss it, but necessarily this, this whole pandemic that we're involved in, mm -hmm. it's the very first time since the last world war, last two world wars, where it, literally every person on the planet with a radio, with a television, with internet access, knows something all at once. We know this all at once. Everybody is involved in knowing what's going on. It's like, it takes yourself back to the JFK assassination. Uh, the day in 1962, I believe it was, November 21st, everybody knew what was going on. Because it was live on TV. Television. Yeah, radio, TV, yeah. everything. That's and, right. Yeah. But, so the human family was together at that time. And that, that's the, that those kinds of, of um, those kinds of incidents that bring the whole human family together in one quick instant uh, or a protracted period of time is a, is a, is a life-changing experience. And the next one that's going to come about, and I can guarantee you the next one that's going to come about, will be the UFO disclosure event. And it will bring the entire human family together in the same kind of instant that the pandemic did, in the right. same kind of instant that World War II and World War I did. It will be an apocalyptic event that everybody's going to say, my, like I said earlier, my goodness, 
uh, how long has this been going on and why didn't somebody tell me about it? And once that incident happened, now how it's going to happen? Will it be a mass sighting? Will it be the President of the United States uh, at some point in the you know, next four to five years coming on television on a Friday night just before the weekend and saying, ladies and gentlemen, I have some news for you. And I think you won't be better, better be sitting down for this one. Okay? <laughs> and then yeah. he, goes, he goes on. That's the kind of event that's going to make the flip to have people understand over the next four, five, 10, 15 years that we as a human family are on the next step or on the threshold of the next step of our evolution because it will take us into a completely intellectual, spiritual, cultural, anthropological, different modes of reasoning will come into play and we will look at every single incident through the lens of the off-world civilization uh, perspective. We will look at everything through that lens. And once people get that lens in front of them and look at every aspect of their life through that lens, the technological implications, the social implications, the religious implications, are we alone in the universe? Uh, these things aren't a threat anymore, or we're part of a galactic community. All of us, those small pieces of information bound together will have a cultural and anthropological change that will that will shape the planet for the rest of uh, for the rest of eternity and i'm convinced of that and it's going to take one incident and i'm just not sure what that's going to be well i told our viewer with you you're right it's going to be there's a ufo sitting on the 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 parliament hill in ottawa or the white house lawn and somebody out introducing an, an et of some sort it's mm -hmm. going to mm -hmm. actually yeah, we can tell the people, but until you actually show the that's people, right. exactly. that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And yeah. But I'm still surprised that so few people pay attention to it. Uh, we do need more mainstream media to start getting on and, and pushing it. Maybe in six months when the when that uh, that paper, that, uh, that law now basically says you will disclose more information, mm -hmm. maybe that's the next big jump. And uh, it could be more of, uh, you know, we're, we're growing that little D to a big D, and I'm going to call that full disclosure. What you just described, when somebody changes the entire thought process of the entire world at once, and, boy, it's so easy to do now, as you said, COVID-19 did it, yeah. because we can communicate to almost the entire world instantaneously. Instantaneously, yeah. 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 And that's a huge leap, and I still think that was helped, because fiber optics is all the basis of the Internet, and if we didn't have that today, you and I will still be sending pens and papers and phone calls. <laughs> or smoke signals. <laughs> smoke signals. Like, it's, I can't believe how far we've progressed yeah. in all these years. And I'm a computer engineer, so <laughs> I understand yeah. all this stuff. I, I think we need to spend just two seconds. I'm not sure how much time we have left, Dave. But I think we need to go back to Marco Rubio, the senator, and what he's done and why he's done it. Uh, and he has, he seems to be familiar with this thing. He's, he's kind of dug his, his fingers into some of the... Uh, into the pies that are, that are surrounding him with all the different issues with respect to the UAP matter. He has done this, I think, for a really good reason. He doesn't want anything to happen right now, but I think he's setting himself up for later on after the new president uh, takes takes his position. So the sometime oh, next year. I heard you say new passed, president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to get into that. Don't one. get into that, please. <laughs> that's another podcast. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly. All right, sorry to interrupt you there, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, he's setting. He's getting on the right side of history. He because is because the senators, the senators that are that are going to be seeing this uh, this uh, this new piece of legislation, who say, um, Senator uh, Rubio, what's this all about UAP? And and they're going to ask the same question. So the third time I said it, these senators are going to say this through the through the lens of the in, uh, intelligence committee. How long has this been going on, and why yeah. haven't we been told about it? Right, they're exactly. Say it again, mm -hmm. so he's getting himself positioned. So that sometime next year, what he did back, uh, well, I guess about a month ago or so, is announced this whole piece of legislation. He will wait sometime until it to 2021, and and then release this thing and make it public and make it workable. And that will be the, the I think the lubrication that will it incentivize the media to say, my goodness, this is really important. And I think to answer your question earlier about why people aren't picking up on it, as soon as you get people, senators on TV saying, how long has this been going on? Why don't they know about it? I'll say for the fifth time. Yeah. That, that will energize people to ask the same kinds of questions. Exactly. That gets them thinking that, well, yeah, how long has it been going on and why don't I know about it? That's right. Yes, and absolutely. what are the implications of it? Yeah. Yes. So, 
Wow. So this is uh, this is fantastic. I was so pleased to see that article come out. I almost think about it's kind of anticlimactic. You know, they finally said, "Yeah, UFOs are real." Well, let's give it a bit more. Let's. And I'm right. looking forward to the next one and the next one and the next one. So we've heard what's happened. We've heard what's happening. What's about to happen? We've con- done some conjecture on that, some thoughts. But what is it that Victor wants to see happen? Your own personal opinion. What do you want to see happen next? Well, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, what I, what I, first of all, what I would encourage people to do is to go to my uh, news blog, Zudan Communications, and we'll put that, we'll put that up in in the comments yeah. on YouTube because I love reading your pod, your your right. your uh, blogs. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, in that, in the latest one, it explains a lot about what, what we've been talking about. It puts in context for, mm-hmm. um, for the for the average for the average learner. Okay. Okay. If yeah. You don't know a lot about it. It, it. it 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 gets the whole story out there. Now, as far as what I want, what I would like to see is somehow having uh, wise journalists, good journalists like the Leslie Kanes, like the Ralph Blumenthal's and Helen Coopers. And there's a couple here in Toronto, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Benet Menon. He's a he's a writer for the Toronto Star. Yes. He's written two or three different articles, and he actually summarized the last one about a week ago. So we need to get good journalists like that. Brian Bender for the, um, uh, I believe he works for Politico. Yes, he, he writes for Politico. All of these kinds of journalists who are stepping out uh, of the mold of journalists and stepping into the realm of this whole UAP issue, we need more journalists like that, and that's what I want. I want these these independent journalists, who, independent thinkers, anyways, who work for good organizations, to come out and to begin to educate the general public through their own articles and eventually editorials in papers like the New York Times editorial, the Toronto Star editorials. Mm-hmm. And we can't minimize the influence of the Toronto Star. It's got a whole new ownership, and it may go in a totally different direction. And we could be at the forefront of, uh, of some sort of disclosure here in Canada with respect to the Toronto Star, because they could be breaking the story soon. So those are the kinds of things that I want to see happen. Good journalists, credible journalists, being involved in this whole uh, idea of breaking the news to the journal public, to, to, to bring them around and to stop with the, you just said earlier, you know, I just make it, it's not a whole hum issue anymore. No. So it's got to be something that gets into their blood, into their concerns about, and standing there filling your car up with, with gas and standing there saying, there's got to be a better way than this. Yeah. I think the well, energy that you're talking about on the news, that could make a difference. <laughs> you know, and questions like that in the, in the human mind generate people's interest in this kind of stuff. And when you're intellectually uh, curious about that, which I hope you know, most of the public could be once this thing really hits, uh, it, will, it will change people's minds. So it's a slow process, and I think we've made the greatest leaps in the past three years than we've made in the last 50. So um, oh, you're here. I'm encouraged by it. I'm, I'm happy with it, and I think it's going to continue, David. I'm hoping it is, and I'm going to do the best that I can to continue it. I know Zeland Communications will be right there as one of those reporters. Uh, I look forward to hearing more from you uh, on a constant, ongoing basis. Um, MUFON Canada, obviously, with these podcasts, and, and, and we will be out in the country soon as we are officially allowed to, doing presentations uh, to small local groups, service groups, mm-hmm. out of libraries, things like that. Right. Um, we've got a dozen people already have signed out to do presentations. We've got the material for them to present, uh, some uh, PowerPoint presentations, some handout literature. Terrific. Uh, we're ready to roll. And, uh, of course, now I have to update the PowerPoint uh, to <laughs> add in the latest New York Times article. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's uh, what it's going to bring to us. So, yeah, we're going to do everything we can, too. And hopefully that in Canada, Move on Canada becomes sort of a central point for uh, information and knowledge on ufology and bring everybody together like yourself and and all the other ufologists in Canada and uh, the groups that go out and actually search and hunt and try to get more information and of course all our field investigators who talk to all the witnesses who actually um, have sightings and just to let you know our sightings are up this year and the amount of actual UFO or unknown cases has uh, almost doubled. So the percentage wow. used to be three to five. We were up into five to eight percent of actual Amazing. UFO sightings that we have confirmed. And I noticed the videos are getting better. 
So what Dave wants, uh, I'll, I'll answer the same question to ask you, is no more swamp gas and weather balloons. <laughs> Tell the bloody truth. And it's, it's there to be told, and it's started. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, well, if, if there's any way that Z-Land Communications can be uh, a, a part of what MUFON's doing, and I know that, uh, that we have a very close and, uh, and uh, intimate relationship between the two organizations, and if there's anything that Z-Land Communications can do to help you get the word out, I report the news. Uh, I don't right. collect uh, sighting reports or anything. I, I report and I try to do a bit of interpretation of the news so that people want to look at it from a... Uh, being a former principal and a teacher, I try to look at it from an academic and journalistic point of view mm -hmm. uh, rather than foisting opinions on people. And I try to interpret the information so that it makes it a little bit more palatable for people who are attempting to really struggle with it, an issue that is going to be a life changer no matter how it happens. Oh, definitely a life changer, yep. So, all right, well, we have a challenge, and I, uh, I really appreciate you coming on to discuss what's just happened. Uh, I'll have you on again in a few months uh, or six months or so when the next uh, announcement comes out and we'll discuss that. Um, and we have a lot more guests coming who also have a lot more to add to this. I told you in a pre-interview uh, there about what's happening and I can't announce it yet. Uh, I keep all the guests kind of quiet and secret because I want people to tune in. But I, I guarantee every one of these uh, episodes, these uh, podcasts is going to have something uh, a little, you know, let's say eye-opening or shocking even. Some of the announcements that are coming some of, from some of the guests. So I look forward to continuing to doing this. I look forward to continuing to talk uh, to you. And, of course, I look forward to having you as our MC in 2021 ACE. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we couldn't do it. We are strong and ready to go with the Alien well, Cosmic sure. Expo in 2021. And I love having you as our MC. And it's going to be better than ever. So uh, sure. I won't tell any more about it right now. It's all under discussion right now. Uh, it will be probably September time frame of next year, 2021. And it uh, can't be the same time we're doing the uh, Shag Harbor uh, uh, <laughs> because I'm going out to Shag Harbor this year. I was I supposed to go this again. year, but I'll definitely go out next year. So anyways, uh, I got Nova Scotia in my, in my blood from my mother. She was born out there. Yeah. So thank you very much. You have yourself a, a great evening and time. I'll keep Zealand in... in, in uh, I guess anything I find that's newsworthy that comes through our channels, I'll get it out to you because you do a great job getting it out. And I know you send me a lot of stuff. I read your blog, so I look forward to continuing our communications. And let's see, uh, let's see if we can turn the public around. And uh, what can I say? Thank you very much. We'll talk to you again on the next one. It's been a pleasure, Dave, and best of luck to me for our candidates. Great work. Thank you very much.